Now we're being told to eat bugs. They're trying to say that cow is destroying the climate. What they're doing is they're trying to take animal protein out of our consumption model, turn it into basically something that's grown and produced in the labs. How has our food and our health transformed in the last few decades? What is behind these changes? 88% of Americans are now metabolically compromised. We've introduced more and more fake commodities that make hundreds of millions of dollars for the industrial food complex. In this episode, I sit down with Texas Slim, founder of the Beef Initiative. Why is Bill Gates buying up a quarter of a million acres of farmland across the United States? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Welcome to Ginger Hill. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. It's kind of a windy day, but here we are. That's right. It's That's not right. bad though. We're close to the cows. Where we're standing right now is close to the oldest established town in the United States of America. This is some of the most fertile land that we came from. And how that land became to be in this nation was through something I call beef intelligence. And what we've lost as a nation is that form of intelligence. What is the cow? What is soil? You know, what is nutrition? Uh, what is food intelligence? What is health? Well, it all starts basically with the cow. How are these cattle different from the typical cattle that we might get in a typical supermarket? Basically, what these cows are doing right now, they're land tools. They, we call it regenerative regenerative farming and ranching. What they do is they basically consume and they basically process soil, grass, and, and whenever you go into the global beef industry, in which basically really did start in the United States, but it was really stewarded by the multinational corporations, they have a different protocol. One thing, and I learned, you know, my grandfather, I come from West Texas, we come from cattle country. Uh, he always taught me, he, he said that a cow is a land tool. What does that mean? And what it means, they allow us to eat the earth. And this is how we got here. We, we, the vitamins and minerals in which we got here by our ancestors, it comes from the soil. So what a cow does is basically rebuilds that soil. And, and in today's modern times, people have forgotten that. They don't know what nutrition is. They really don't know what food is. But what basically we can look at the cow as is they were stewards of land, they're stewards of our health, they were stewards of our community, they were a steward of our nation at one time. And what's fascinating, and I was thinking about this this morning, you can release these cows onto a pasture. They will go straight to the highest protein source and they will consume that. And then they know how to deliver that protein through their systems to us. We honor them, we let them have a good life. And I always say, a cow that's basically raised and stewarded in a regenerative way, they have one bad day and that's it. The rest of their life is at peace, just like they have right now. What does the regenerative way mean and how is that different from the other ways? Well, the regenerative, and there's a lot of different definitions, a lot of different meanings to generalized, don't like to do that, but what it is is the input. You, you have very little input, you know, from chemical to grain to artificial, whatever it is. Regenerative means regenerative. What does regeneration mean? It means that you have soil, you have grass, you have forage, you have cows. Well, you team them up together and they regenerate energy. Energy from the soil, energy in the cow, energy to you and I. We don't have to put a lot of inputs into those cows to say, hey, you know, give me what I, I need from you. We let them regenerate with what they know how to do best. And that is basically regrow soil. And that's the big conspiracy going on right now that, you know, a uh, cow is a carbon hazard. No, they're not. They're the best thing that's uh, ever happened to soil. With what is going on in the cattle industry and basically the global industrial food shift that we're going through right now, they're they're just gonna increase the cattle production across the world. What they're gonna eliminate is market access to those cows to the Western countries, starting places like America, Australia. Then most Americans will not end up eating beef anymore. They will turn it into caviar and they will basically not allow them to have market access. 
Texas Slim, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was a good drive into town today. It's good to see you. So we're here to talk about your initiative, the Beef Initiative. And I'll, for starters, I'll just say like beef has kind of been getting a bad rap lately. People would say, well, there's, there's no reason to be cruel to the cow. What do we really need meat? Might as well be vegetarian. You know, I remember I once, you know, look, I don't know what I was doing. I was in a library. I think I was procrastinating studying for some course. Right. And I looked up basically the patent for something called the, you know, industrial hog stripper. Mm -hmm. This isn't, this isn't beef, right? This is obviously a uh, pork that we're talking about. Right. Um, but it, it was frankly horrifying. Right. And so the idea is that at scale, you know, we need, we need to feed the planet. So we need to have these, you know, industrial level uh, animal processing facilities. Sure. And that's often what you think of when you think of, you know, inhumane treatment to animals. Yes. And there's, there's, if you look at the industrial food supply and in the way that we've kind of changed within the last 50 years, we used to have one microprocessing center back to what you were saying as far as, you know, this type of industrial way to where very few animals were processed each day. What we had is a multitude of processing centers all across this nation. And so the animal welfare was far better before we industrialized our food supply. And I agree, there's a lot of nefarious ways to basically harvest an animal that should not be d done to, the, to this day. If you look at the poultry industry, you look at the hog industry, you have uh, basically warehouses in China that you know have over a half a million hogs in them. And it's not anything that we basically recommend or tout within the beef initiative. We agree with you. So let's get back to the micro level in which we, where we came from. Let's get back to the source of the seed of that animal welfare. And like I said, I mean, I was just on a ranch. I mean, you know where I was this weekend. Those cows are the happiest cows I've ever seen. And they have one bad day and they are honored. They are respected. And you look at the, basically the, the makeup of a cow, the, the, the spirit of a cow, Whenever you do go through a harvest of that animal, if that cow is stressed and it has adrenaline going the time that it does leave this planet, I guess it's, you know, that it is harvested, that meat's not going to be as good. And so there's a deep dive that I think the American public needs to get back to. Let's get back to the source of the seed of what it means to basically have animal welfare. And let's look at our consumption model and see why we're at where we are when it comes to the animal welfare that people like to argue against. The Beef Initiative is basically lock, step, and barrel with taking care of, you know, livestock. That's what we do. That's, I come from West Texas, a West Texas cowboy that knows how to take care of cattle. And that's something that I think this nation has kind of lost, and that's the message that the Beef Initiative is basically going to start yelling from the mountaintop. There's this huge separation between a whole lot of the population and the food supply. Mm -hmm. and just like knowing for even where it comes from. Sure. Like I've heard of examples of people, you know, you're, you're going to the super, you, there's young kids that imagine the food comes from the supermarket. Sure. For example, right? You because bet. they just haven't been taught anything else. No, and I've, you know, you, you've, you and I have talked and, you know, to give a little backstory of me, you know, over between three and four years ago, I started driving across this country and I did started talking, I started talking to communities. I've done the back roads. I've traveled around the world. I've gone on several, you know, several trips across this nation. And I have found that most people do not know where food comes from anymore. And, you know, I'm generational X. And so I was able to grow up on a farm ranch. That's, that's, that was my life. And I've seen how we've evolved when it does come to food. And, and, and it's, it's sad that a lot of, let's say inner city kids or just even kids in a, in a medium sized city, they do, that's the response. Food comes from the supermarkets. And that's part of the industrialization of our food. That's the, the part of the industrial food complex that is highly processed, 
you know, the, the, the seeds in which where we came from into this new concoction that we, we think is food because it has labels on it and it has pictures on it and it has, you know, safety and it has, you know, heart healthy. And so if we get back to understanding and re-educating, where do you start to re-educate a nation about where food comes from? Well, I tell everybody, go shake a rancher's hand and you'll understand where food comes from. A lot of people don't have a rancher in their immediate vicinity. I mean, I'm talking about people living in the city, people, for example, living, living here, not, you know, maybe many of them don't head out of the city very much, mm -hmm. right? They're kind of, this is, this is where they live. It, ranching is not a part of their frame of reference at all. Mm -hmm. So true. Um, you know, we have several, I put on probably, and we held through the Beef Initiative with everybody that's involved with the Beef Initiative, probably seven to eight conferences last year alone. What we're doing is we're opening the gates. And let's put that in perspective. If somebody is, let's say, in New York City or in Washington, D.C., and there's some people that do not ever leave the city. And what I wanted to do with the Beef Initiative is we live in a digital world, correct? It's like, okay, and you look at in which we consume, we consume audio, video, and food. Well, how can we basically bring everybody into the, the lifestyle that is ranching? Well, you look at, okay, Yellowstone is the number one TV show in, in America. So let's open the gates, and if you can't access, you don't have that market access to an open gate of a ranch, we'll come through the Beef Initiative. And, you know, you asked, you know, I get this asked all the time, but what is the Beef Initiative? Well, it's about building relationships. And you can build a relationship, and I say, well, if you can't go out there and physically shake a rancher's hand, come through the Beef Initiative basically and, and shake a hand digitally. You know, because we're giving you full, clean market access to that rancher. And so everybody loves to use Google. Well, we have an index within the Beef Initiative where you can go and search for a rancher. You can establish that relationship. You can call a rancher. You can reach out to them. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship that you can establish, be it digitally or if you're going to get in your car and take your family. You know, all these ranchers want to open their, their gates. I think it's a, I basically tell everybody it's a new international lifestyle. You just don't understand it yet. Well, it's very interesting because, you know, in the current, in the current sort of model, the more industrialized model, right? There's mm -hmm. the farm, then there's the, the company, often multinational company. Sure. That's, that's buying that cattle or the rancher is basically producing for that company. And then that company will deliver via... I guess a supermarket or mm -hmm. something like that to the to the consumer. This is something where you know it, you're you're looking at the scale of a community, mm -hmm. right? Where the rancher and the the people in the area, basically going back to this model of these what you call the micro production centers and so forth. Sure. Um, and that creates this one to one relationship. And on top of that because of the means of production, and this is what I want you to explain to me, if I understand this right, this is, this is done in a more natural and clean way. So explain this to me. In the way that you look at, the state of Texas has 254 counties, correct? Well, we used to have 254 microprocessing centers in the state of Texas. The bottleneck of all, basically, I say that the lack of nutrition that we're receiving as a nation right now is because we have scaled everything on a global front. We've taken that wholesome seed out of the community and the, the able to process that food in our community. And a lot of times, like where I come from in the Panhandle, Texas, we have all the multinational processing centers. There's four of them that process 85% of our animal protein in the United States, four multinational corporations. Okay, and then let's refer back to 254 counties, 254 microprocessing centers. Okay, whenever you have microprocessing centers in your community, usually you have farmers, ranchers, processors, distribution, all focused on a 30 to 60 mile radius. That's who they're targeting to feed. That's what my grandfather did. That's what a lot of people's grandparents and ancestors did in the United States before we basically came in, 
we took those microprocessing centers out. We, let's say we processed that cow. I'm outside of a place called Hereford, Texas in the Texas Panhandle. The beef comes in, the cow comes into one of the multinational processing centers. Well, they process thousands and thousands of cattle every week, correct? Well, that beef, we don't even know where it goes anymore. And, you know, a lot of times it goes over to seas to the highest bidder on the global beef industry. You know, we don't have a say-so of where that beef goes to. We don't have a say-so of basically how do we feed our children because the bottleneck is that processing center. So if we can invert it back into the microprocessing center, we have control of the market access and the distribution of that beef. Then we're gonna start with our community first, and then we will go out. Now beef gets processed in my community and it's sent overseas. Sometimes it even comes back after it's been highly processed into a different form and you know with fake commodities added to it you know different types of uh commodities that are added into our food supply and we'll probably get into that a little bit later but you know it's it's pretty daunting but uh you know what we have to do is once again bring perspective about where we came from and what did give our communities that form of strength and power to the ranchers themselves to our children to our, you know, to the whole uh, livelihood of basically our families. Well, so this is a perfect opportunity to talk about, you know, I guess a bit about where you came from and also how you kind of embedded yourself, I guess, into a harvesting company and, and just sort of discovered some of the reality of the um, food production, but not on this, is this isn't on the meat side. This is on the uh, oil side and the, right? Yeah. Well, you know, where I came from, you know, I, I like to kind of romanticize it because it's West Texas, but uh, it's the desert high plains. It's, it's the end of the breadbasket of America. And, you know, I grew up, uh, my grandfather had two sections out of a place called Lockney, Texas, small Texas town, small town America. And, you know, I grew up, you know, I know how, I know tractors, I know cattle, I know animal welfare, I know combines, uh, worked harvests my whole life. And so that side of my life and, you know, my roots of where, you know, which I came from, I know how to go on a harvest. I'd had a, a health scare and I started deep, in, you know, deep, doing a deep dive into our food systems, you know, looking at the health of the nation. I was looking at my health, health personally. I went to the accountability mirror and I said, OK, if you survive this health scare, then you're going to. You're going to do whatever it takes to bring a new form of food intelligence to yourself, but then to your family, and you're going to honor your grandparents. So to me, the logical place to do and to find the information that I was searching for was to go on harvest. And if you look at harvest, you know, there's several harvests throughout the years. In the state of Texas, you start in Texas, you go all the way to Canada, and you come back. And you start with wheat, and you do corn, you know, throughout the seasons. It's a fascinating journey. So I just, one, one morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got up with no rhyme or reason. I sent out a couple of emails, and within probably seven hours, I was going to Kansas to do a harvest. So this is a canola harvest? Well, it was supposed to be a wheat harvest. Mm -hmm. When we went on a harvest, we ended up in North Dakota and uh, a lot of wheat, uh, you know, up the Midwest. You, you go on wheat harvest. They even call it wheat harvest. By the time we got to North Dakota, usually your crops are about 80% wheat. That's what you're going to do. That year alone, it was fascinating because all of a sudden we're not doing wheat harvest, we're doing rapeseed. Rapeseed is canola. That's what most of the general public, you know, knows what it is. And I knew from where I came from, rapeseed was outlawed by the, uh, the FDA in 1956 because of its toxicity. And all of a sudden, on the radios and everything, they're saying that there's going to be a shortage of wheat this year. And I started correlating everything that they were reporting, everything that the farmers basically were hearing and what we were doing within that harvest. That harvest of that year was almost, almost, probably a, I would say 45% wheat, 55% rapeseed. And you look at rapeseed, you look at canola, 
why would we actually be doing rapeseed over wheat? Well, the farmers that I talked to, and I talked to many of them, they said, well, we're making more money off of rapeseed. They're demanding that we plant more rapeseed. Okay, canola oil is a seed oil, and it was introduced really as one of the fake commodities that really took off in the ni early 1970s when we started monocropping as a nation. And, you know, vegetable oil basically has overtaken, you know, tallow, which is animal fat. And um, whenever you're supplementing rapeseed, a toxic weed that the FDA says now, and they, you know, they, it's industrialized seed that becomes nothing more than motor oil. And so whenever that is becoming the majority of your harvest, we have an issue. It's as simple as that. It's a big thing to say that, you know, canola is nothing more than motor oil because this is like the, I think the, probably the most common oil used. I mean, we are, in fact, as a Canadian, we're always proud of the fact that canola was, you know, engineered because it is a, it's a, it's a genetically engineered rapeseed, which I understand sure. reduces the toxicity and it has some, I can't remember, some wonderful properties which allow it to be grown at scale and, uh, yes. and, and used so prolifically, right? At least that's the story I've heard. Right. You, 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 you know, you said motor oil. Like it's not motor oil. I mean, I, I, I've used it it's, a lot in my life, right? Sure. Yeah. And, but you can put it in your car. It's, it's almost, be, you know, tongue in cheek. Let's say that. Okay. It's, it's an oil and it's industrialized. And you, you look at the, the introduction of vegetable oils, and a lot of people don't know, you know, where did vegetable oils come from? Well, Procter & Gamble used to be the biggest candle maker in, in the world in the early 1900s. And basically all of a sudden they quit selling candles. Why did people quit buying candles? We have electricity. And so what'd they do with all that uh, candle? Well, what were the candles made from? Well, they were made from industrialized cotton seeds that were made into an oil. And so that was kind of the first introduction Vegetable oils were all the way back in the 1850s. But as we grew, we started industrializing, industrializing more of the seeds. We were using all of the, you know, the seed itself. And you look at Crisco was what we invented to basically, instead of candles, we started basically using Crisco. So you look at vegetables and you look at how they were introduced into our diets in the United States. They really ramped up after somebody called Ansel Keys really, you know, said the cholesterol lie, animal fat. So there, there's been a long history of introducing vegetable oils into our consumption as a nation. Not to say that vegetable oil is horrible for you, you know, because we do. We've all grown up consuming vegetable oil. But for the, for the industrial food complex, and if you look, everybody take out the wrappers, of anything you want right now, you're going to find some type of industrial oil basically that is embedded into every food product that we have. It's a fake commodity. It is something that the industrial food complex makes millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars off of every year. And if you look at the introduction on the mass quantity size that has been introduced into our consumption models as a nation, it's basically something that's really starting to have a detrimental effect on our health. This comes with, not from me, not this cowboy from West Texas, this comes from doctors, from heart surgeons. And so there's a big anti-seed oil movement. We don't need it injected into almost every food product that you can buy at the supermarket. When you say fake commodity, what do you mean exactly? In the, in the early 1970s, we went off the gold standard. Okay, whenever we went off the gold standard in 1971, Eric Butts of the Nixon administration also said, hey, you're gonna go big or you can go home. And he was talking to my grandfather. And he was saying, you're gonna go fence to fence with one crop. And that's, that's gonna be a mono crop. And you look at the food supply in the, in the 70s, our dollar got weaker. You know, we went off the gold standard, We've, we debased our dollar. At the same time, we debased our food in a way that we had never done before. You can go to, the, you can go to Google right now and look at uh, pictures of Venice Beach in 1969, and you look at the health of a nation and what we looked at, looked like in 1969, before we started introducing fake commodities into our food system. 
1971 was a bellwether year that we did start introducing fake commodities. And when I say that, that's when in, in my public school system and in, in Texas, we started eating soy burgers. And so I say fake commodities are the type of industrialized, I don't know, products that we started injecting into our food supply. Before 1971, whole food was what we ate. We ate basically from the ground up. We ate green beans that were grown right there. We didn't have all these additives that were in our food supply. Throughout the history in the last 50 years, we've introduced more and more fake commodities that make hundreds of millions of dollars for the industrial food complex. And, it, and, it, and it's only getting more. And you look at the attack of, the, of beef and, and, and the cow in general, well, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make cow a carbon hazard globally. They're trying to say that cow is destroying the climate. You know, what they're doing is they're trying to take animal protein out of our consumption model and they're going to insert some more fake commodities that are more nothing more than industrial processed types of protein that doesn't come from basically animal protein. But why is it fake? I mean, it's still it's still food. Like you can get tofu. You know, like I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm just thinking out loud here, right? Sure. But, you know, tofu is a pretty actually a, you know ain't been around for centuries, millennia. Mm -hmm. um, very good source of protein because um, you, you just mentioned soy burgers I guess I'm trying to understand why is it fake because we've genetically modified everything uh, before 1971 we weren't genetically modifying everything and we talk about tofu soy well let's talk about Japan yeah they, they've basically been consuming soy for thousands of years I guarantee you their soy in Japan is not even comparable to the soy in the United States of America and the type of soy that we've introduced, the fake commodity that it is, that is making hundreds of millions of dollars for the industrial food complex for those that actually genetically modify that seed and do basically process that seed into a fake commodity, you can't compare. So we're comparing apples to oranges. And I think that's where we have to bring that perspective back a bit and say, okay, I've been to Japan, you've been to Japan, I think. I've been to Asia. So, you know, if we're going to compare that soy to the soy that we're consuming and we're giving our children right now, it's not a fair comparison. So the comparison is in terms of nutrition, I guess. Sure. That's what you're talking 100%. about. Sure, 100%. Right. Yeah. You have to eat five apples now comparative to whenever I was a child and you only had to eat one of those apples. Why did that happen? Well, it's because we started genetically modifying. We started introducing a mass amount of chemicals into our consumption models. As we've done that, as we've industrialized our food, as we've homogenized our food, commoditized our food, the nutritional value of that wholesome apple is decreasing. And at the same time, our health is decreasing. At the same time, our dollar is debasing. So you look at that, there is a correlation. And you know, we're, we're, I think we'll see this more and more. We're in hyperinflation right now. Food is extremely expensive right now, but they don't put it at part of inflation, right? They don't put it part of the inflation model. Why is that? And so, you know, they were able to subsidize and commoditize food in a way that made it very cheap for them to manufacture. And so as they made the food cheaper, well, they made our nutritional value cheaper as well, as far as the individual person that is consuming that. Now I think I understand what you've mentioned the term food intelligence a number sure. of times. So food intelligence, I think you're saying, is understanding what it is you're, you're eating, how uh, how to find the things that actually have the nutrition that are mm -hmm. perhaps more traditional. Am I getting that right? You bet, 100%. There's something that make, you make me think of mm -hmm. when talking about, you know, working, having the producer and the consumer both within the community, yeah. right? That creates a certain kind of accountability, which might be absent in these kind of larger scaled up uh, uh, realities that, that mm -hmm. we face today. It just strikes me that, that there, you kind of have to have 
there has to be more integrity because you have immediate accountability. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? It really does. And, you know, I was kind of visualizing as you were speaking and reflecting back to, you know, small town Texas and really much the nation throughout, you know, the period of, you know, the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years. You know, we used to walk in, there was a butcher. Okay. We don't have butchers anymore. We have people that wear white jackets. And if you go back into a supermarket and you talk to one of the persons, and this is nothing against those people that are working their jobs and providing for themselves and their family, but we don't have that skill set anymore. And you talk about obligation and accountability. Whenever you are part of a community, you have obligation. There is a form of integrity that comes with that obligation. It comes with a form of authenticity. Whenever you have accountability to the person in your community and you want to provide them the best product you can, it does bring a different type of responsibility. It is something that you basically get back to where I have to bring integrity into what I do whenever I am basically producing this for my community. It is an obligation. And I think that, you know, how I was raised we didn't have to worry about diets. We didn't have to worry about nutrition because the, the producer, the true producer of that food product took on that accountability. That's who they were. That's, that was their spirit. They, they loved it and they, they, they had a skill set that we've, we've also lost in this nation. And that's, you know, that's another thing that the Beef Initiative is. It's like, let's get these skill sets back. We want to get back to where we can have that type of accountability. So something that strikes me also, uh, when it comes to working for a large company, mm -hmm. right? That large company has all sorts of rules and you know standards that you have to fulfill for ostensibly for to maintain quality because you wouldn't want to have subpar things in you know in, in their in their food system. But it also it, it feels like that might take away exactly this kind of accountability that you were just describing, where someone is mm -hmm. you know, basically proud of the thing they're producing the best they can according to the best of their skills, as opposed to fulfilling you know, this very, very specific set of rules that's brought down to them using the same feed, using the same, let's say, antibiotics potentially, mm -hmm. um, basically just kind of being part of this industrialized system. Let's look at the industrialized size of processing centers right now. Who works in those processing centers? Uh, used to, well, it was a butcher. I grew up with some of my best friends growing up in, in West Texas. Their fathers were basically, they worked in processing centers. They knew how to cut up a cow. They knew how to create every cut of the cow, every cut, just not one cut. Now, if you go into a processing center, basically you're going to have an assembly line that is long and daunting, and you're going to have many, many, you know, uh, carcasses hanging, and that's a lot of the propaganda. That's what a lot of people like to show whenever they're attacking the cow and the beef industry in general. Well, now let's talk about our society and how we've compartmentalized skill sets. Well, in the processing center, you're going to have somebody that knows how to do one or two or three cuts at a time and that's it they're not going to know the full basically skill and artisanship of how to carve up a cow and so whenever you compartmentalize um, and you don't have as much accountability there's something that it's task driven and that task is basically all you're truly focused on that is your purpose is to complete the task but that type of skill set that they bring is something that is nothing comparable to what we came from. Once again, the artisanship of processing. I really enjoyed myself uh, at the Cattlemen's Feast. Uh, sure. And what I found myself doing was going, you know, I, I was actually sampling, you know, while the barbecue was on. So I was pretty full by the time the right. piece came along. But I, I found myself wanting to kind of try a little bit of every part of the animal mm -hmm. um, that that every cut of the meat that that sure. old butch had 
had basically put together. And it was, it was kind of amazing to discover how different they actually are. And these, you, you think it's almost exactly the same, but mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you don't really think about, uh, uh, you know, the, it's the texture, even the flavor, there's all these, I mean, it, was, it was fascinating. It was, it was very much an educational experience for me. Well, and in, in you and I were up there at the very beginning, and you know we were talking to old Butch, Johnny, and the, we had a half a cow there that day. Oh, wow. I didn't realize this was full. Yeah. Oh, my. So <laughs> nothing's trimmed. This is just completely Fascinating. Side, just side off, nothing taken off. And that's just basic caramelization, again, of leaving that fat on. All that amazing. healthy animal yeah. fat, right? Exactly. That source of animal fat. And that's that going. To, that's going to go well, right you know, back what, into your body. It's amazing that that we, you know, we've been taught that fat is terrible. Yes, right? exactly. Man, I can't wait for later. Oh <laughs> no. yeah, <laughs> right. That half a cow was on the table, and we had everything. And he had it in the grill. We had the fire going right next to it. We saw the kidney. We saw the heart. We saw a tongue. We saw every part of that cow that we can use and we can consume. And you look at how much we have lost as far as knowing what's available to basically actually consume on parts of the cow. Once again, multinational processing centers, how many cuts of the cow do they offer us through the supermarkets? What do we have, a, a ribeye, a filet, a New York strip, ribs sometimes? Nobody really understands what we've lost when it does come to the cuts of the cow. The processing center is going to be kind of the center of the universe for the narrative moving forward and getting them back into the communities. No chemicals used during processing. The fact that I work at a USDA packing plant and it's a clean one and we're just we're traceable from from enter to exit. It's just really full circle. Like you experienced firsthand you know, we left all the fat on most of the cow. That's part of the cow that you can actually use to flavor, to cook with. You know, the whole orchestration of the preparation of it, I think we've lost as far as a form of beef intelligence in this nation to get back to understanding the cow and how valuable it is to us and how valuable it is to our communities. How much of the cow that we can actually use to nourish our bodies to basically bring back to what we used to leverage of the cow from the hides to leather to everything from nose to tail, that's what beef intelligence is. You know, a lot of people had heart the other day at the Cattleman's Feast at Ginger Hill Angus. They didn't even know they were eating heart and they were talking about how good it was. You, you've talked about the fact that you expect there to be a kind of crisis in the food supply. Mm -hmm. Explain to me why you think that. We've had a consolidation of uh, industrial corporations when it comes to food, the multinational corporations. 2017, 2018, we had the last major consolidation of chemical and grain companies and with uh, the industrial food complex. They are trying to basically create a one world food group. What they're doing, be it, be it nefarious, be it in a way that they are trying to change what we do consume as humans, it's happening. The marketing behind it is big. I just got back from Australia. I got back from Asia. I spent two months overseas. Um, the marketing is coming. You have uh, a lot of things that are happening on the highest level of our food supply chain lines. In the beef industry, there's a lot of manipulation. We had a multinational corporation during COVID gets fined $56 million because of price manipulation. They made over $500 million in profit. What they did is they're able to, I'd say, decrease and increase the food supply in a way that is detrimental to the consumers. It's detrimental to the producers. And whenever you give them that much power, and I'm not going to say how it's going to happen, but there'll be a shift in our food supply. And a lot of people, they won't even notice it because the types of ingredients, the type of things that they're introducing into our food supply, like I said, they're in introducing a new fake commodity system, which is gonna be basically 
you know, taking out animal protein and injecting soy protein into everything. Whenever I was in Australia, they, every protein bar that me and my son looked for in Australia, it was soy protein. It wasn't whey grass-fed protein. And so I believe with this shift, there's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be supply chain lines that are disrupted, but I know that basically nutrition is going to be downgraded even more than it already is. We have the proof. There was a report that came out, 88% of Americans are now metabolically compromised. We have over 10 to 20 doctors that basically do give data and reports to the Beef Initiative. The number one metabolical uh, disease right now in the United States of America is fatty liver disease. And it's not because of alcoholism, it's because of the industrial food complex in which what we consume. So whenever I say there's going to be a shift, well, there's going to be a shift in nutrition and they're going to come with marketing plans such as you're saving the planet. I say that they're trying to take out the animal and the soil out of our consumption model and turn it into basically something that is grown and produced in the labs. And if you look at what, you know, we all like to talk on Bill Gates, why is he buying up all the farmland in the United States? Well, so, so tell me a little bit. So give me a sense of that. How much farmland does Bill Gates actually have? At this point in time, whenever I wrote The Harvest of Deception, he, he was about 242,000 acres of farmland in the United States. And that's a lot of farmland. Why is Bill Gates buying up, you know, a quarter of a million acres of farmland across the United States? During COVID, uh, China bought up probably about the same amount of farmland in the United States. Well, it's to control the food supply. I mean, if you're buying up the best farmland in the world, in the middle of America and some of the best soil in America, what are the intentions? Okay, well now Bill Gates is also uh, one of the biggest investors in fake meat products that are coming to the storefronts. You know, you have all the fake meat commodities that are being introduced into the supermarkets. But I, I believe that's a distraction. What they're doing is, you know, you hear me, you know, how, the, how we insert uh, canola oil into almost everything that we consume right now. Well, let's look at basically fake protein and how they're inserting it in most of our products as well. And now we're, we're being told to eat bugs. And they're going to say because it's saving the planet and it's just as good as animal protein. It's wrong. It's 100% wrong. And once again, fake commodities being inserted into our consumption models. Yeah, I, I have heard a lot that uh, cows produce too much methane. So we're you know, contributing to global warming, which is a crisis and so forth. So you, I, I take it you don't subscribe to that view. Okay. No, I, I really don't. And you've been around the world you've seen how much land is in this world. What is the number one tool to regrow soil? It's the cow. The cows are land tools. They are the best thing that we have as far as sequester CO2. As far as methane and cow farts, it's not that, it's burps. Okay, they don't have cow farts. That's not what they're talking about, but that's what they like to push. And so I, I really I always say I do not validate deceptions. I don't argue their agendas. And I think that's the smartest thing for everybody to stop doing is kind of laugh at them and mock them because that's probably the biggest lie that I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And so good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, just try and we'll see. So this is what I wanted to ask you about exactly. Sure. So how exactly are are cows the number one tool for sequestering carbon? That's fascinating. It is. Okay, I grew up in the desert high plains once again. Well, what, what was that? Well, that was where the buffalo roamed. And you go back to the panhandle of Texas, some of the most beautiful grasslands were there before any of us got there. Uh, it was Comanche country. How did those grasslands survive? How did they thrive? Well, it's because of the bison. What they do is they come and they graze the, they graze the grass. They fertilize the grass, and then they move on. And so what happens whenever you are able to take that energy out of the soil, you, you consume that grass, the bison or the cow consumes that grass. 
what does that do to the root system of that grass and makes it grow deeper into the soil. Whenever you're able to have a grass system that has a root system that grows deeper and deeper, where does vitamins and minerals and nutrition come from? It comes from the earth. And whenever you're able to regenerate that plant, let's say the grass, the forage, by grazing it with a land tool, then that root system goes deeper and deeper into the soil, deeper into, deeper into density of nutrition, vitamins, and minerals. And in the 1930s, we were looking at soil because we were going through a massive drought in the Midwest. And they did, they brought in a lot of experts. A lot of people they brought in were the Native Americans into the Texas Panhandle. And the Native Americans had a saying, and they looked at the root systems in which what we were doing, and they sat upside down. What did that mean? It's like how we were basically growing our food was upside down. Our root systems had gone from this deep into the soil to this deep in the soil. Therefore, we were not maintaining the basically the, the density of the soil. We were creating a dust bowl and that whenever you're able to regenerate soil, when you're allowing the root systems to go deeper and deeper to the soil, what it does, it creates basically something that can't blow away in the wind. And right now in West Texas, we're suffering another dust bowl. We're in another drought. And why is that happening? Well, you look at look, cotton, corn, everything that we're growing in the Texas Panhandle right now, root systems are this long, this deep. The plants, of course, have, gro have grown much more, you know, taller. They're, 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 they're something that looks very good and pleasing to the eye, correct? Where is the nutrition? Where is the soil? Where is, it's not there anymore because we're using herbicides, pesticides, everything we can besides the soil itself to grow those plants. And, and if you look at soil and what it is, it's not dirt. It's actually basically formed by a regenerative way and where the root systems are the bonding agent of those minerals and the nutrition that are deep down into, you know, underneath our feet. I'm still not clear on how that actually sequesters more carbon. How does that actually make it so that carbon is taken out of the system? The root systems. Mm -hmm. It stays in the soil. The root systems are the delivery of the carbon. You have, you know, you have photosynthesis, you have plants that grow, you take in sunlight. It basically brings in carbon and it basically stays underground. Mm -hmm. So you're taking carbon out and the cow is part of that basically system that delivers the carbon back into the ground, the CO2 back into the ground to where it stays. And I'm not a biologist, but what it does, it stays within the earth, which then it does basically carbon in, in the soil is something that we need. And that's where we, we came from. And whenever you say that, you know, there's too much carbon, well, let's look at monocropping. How much do we plow our soil every year? And, and that's something that, you know, a lot of people don't even realize our soil is dead. Our soil has been ruined. There's a lot of people out there right now that say that we only have 40, uh, 20 years left of soil. And there's, that means we have 40 harvests left. And so you look at the climate change, you look at the people that are pushing climate change. It's those in which have destroyed our soil through the form of monocropping that we've done. And you know, the regenerative movement is something, <laughs> my grandfather didn't know what the word regenerative was. He didn't have to use that word. I just came back from Thailand in the northern mountains of Thailand. They don't know what the word organic means. They don't know what grass fed means. They don't know what regeneration means. All they know is the elders doctrine of knowing where food truly comes from. And they all know that the food comes from deep within the soil. Whenever you look at good, healthy soil, that healthy soil basically sequesters CO2 in the way, in the form it should to be able to not be a hazard, as they say. So, you know, as we finish up, 
there has been a lot of consolidation, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the food food system is very centralized, yes. um, as you've described, and you know, as in frankly, you know, many other structures in 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 our society, it can be daunting to imagine how would you take this on exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It so. is daunting. And that's what we have to get back to is perspective. We need to replicate the successes of each small community. And we have proof of work in the Beef Initiative from hometown meats in Lumley, Texas, from Panhandle Meats in the Panhandle, Texas, to uh, one of the best ranchers that I know in, in Colorado. And he feeds his community. It's Jason Rick of Rick Ranches. He's outside of, he's in Norfolk Valley. We have so many different stories. We have Brooke Miller and his family in which we attended the Junior Hill Angus Beef Initiative Summit. We have all these wonderful successes that are actually happening everywhere across the United States. I just came back from Australia. We had nine functions on farms in Australia. You know, and look at what happened to Australia during COVID. Do you think that they're not worried about their freedoms over there? They are. Where are they starting? They're getting back to the farms. They're going out there and they're shaking the farmer's hand. And here in the United States, I'd say, go and shake your rancher's hand. Don't let it be daunting to you. Think about your child. We're saving child's lives here. The children of this nation are starting to have ill health. Why is that when we're the most advanced society that this world has ever seen? And why are we now the most unhealthiest that I've ever seen in my lifetime? And I think a lot of people realize that. We live in the shadows of our consumption model. Let's not allow it to be daunting anymore. Let's empower ourselves. Let's cowboy up, as I say, because it is time. And whenever you do that, you know, I've been doing this between three and four years. I've had a fascinating life. I've done many things. But I guarantee you the last three or four years of my life have been the most empowering. And once you lose all of the propaganda, when you eliminate it out of your ears and your eyes, then you will have ears to hear and eyes to see what is important in your life. And from what I understand, you're not actually looking to kind of, you know, fight with the, these large multinationals or take them over or anything like that. You're just looking at another way just another way i mean you know during times of let's say mass prohibition the it requires times of mass innovation there's no way that i'm going to fight the multinational corporations they're going to do what they're going to do they serve a purpose in some form or fashion there's many families there's many parents that work for multinational corporations it's ludicrous to think that you know somebody like that calls himself texas slim that created the beef initiative is going to go up and fight multinational corp. That's not what we're doing. We have a business model that we like. It's something that circumvents around basically their protocols of producing food. We don't have to participate. I choose not to participate. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to feed my child a different way than you're maybe recommending to me or that you're marketing to me. And I'm going to choose to say no. And you go ahead and do what you're gonna go ahead and do because I know I can't fight you. This isn't a fight. I'm innovating. Pay attention. Maybe you might learn something from us. Well, Texas Slim, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, this has been a pleasure. And it's, uh, I really wanna uh, show my gratitude and graciousness. Uh, you know, Every time that we're able to speak about what we're doing at the Beef Initiative, it's definitely an honor for me. This is nothing that was planned, but it's actually just something that is happening holistically, and it's, it's because of people like you. So I really do appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining Texas Slim and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Yanya Kellek.